Hello and welcome to Java Games Programming. I'm your host Zan from Zan's Gaming and in this tutorial we'll continue on with Snakes and Ladders, the game we started planning last week. And instead of having you watch me for an hour writing the code, I thought it would be better for me to write the code on my own time and just run you through what I did. So, let's get started. Ladders, board, die, and player. But the difference today is that we have actually code implemented in them. And I'm just going to run through what's going to happen here. We start off with the main game logic, or snakes and ladders. This is our main class, as you can see, the main method here. Uh, we start off with the um, the welcome message, you know, welcome to snakes and ladders, created by Zance Gaming. We prompt the user for the number of players. So first we initialize the scanner. We prompt the user for a number of players. And we want to make sure that it is between uh, one and six. This was our, our arbitrarily chosen decision. And uh, we just wanted to make something which is uh, usable. So I thought one to six players would be OK. We initialize our player objects. So the way we do this is uh, you know, for each player given in the input, which is num players, uh, we do a for loop. And we give each player a name, which is like p0, p1, p2, p3, p4, p5, depending on how many players there are. And we just add them to a list called players. Once we have our players, we initialize our board passing in the players that we had, that we just created right above. And now we go into our game loop. Uh, we have two flags. So one is the done flag, which indicates if we have completed the game or not. And then uh, another flag called player index, which, tick, which uh, uh, holds which player's turn it is. So this is what we're using to uh, see whose turn it is. And we keep looping until we're done, so until the game is finished. We load the current player based on our list. Um, we have that player take their turn. We update the board. And then we hold the result in a variable or update the variable done by based on the, uh, the board update. Now, this returns true if the current player has reached the 100th position or higher. Uh, otherwise, this return false means the game continues looping. Once we have updated the board, we print that board content, and then we also print this big dashed line so that we know which uh, line indicates a, a next turn. Um, and if we are done, we print out the you know the end message, uh, which is current player wins, uh, and then we just update to the next player whose turn it is. So this is our main game logic. This is what's happening um, as the game is going. Now we can go into the other classes to see. Um, how the internal components are being done. So let's take a look at our uh, player class because our player class uh, takes their turn. The player class is quite simple. We have a player has a name. So the name has been updated from last time. Uh, last time we didn't have a name for our player, but I thought it would be interesting to have a name because it makes things much more simpler. Um, so our constructor, we just create a new die and we have uh, the name itself for the player. And then the take turn method, the way it does is it just rolls the die. I mean, roll a d6. We'll go into the die class next, but we roll a d6. It, this returns a value between 1 to 6, inclusive. Um, we print out the message, you know, the player rolled uh, whatever the roll value was, and then it returns it as an int. And then it goes back to our snakes and ladder class. Um, and then we update the board with the current player and the roll value. So Sorry, I uh, should go into the, the die class first. So the die class has a random number generator that's provided by Java as an instance variable. Um, so the constructor for this class is just initializing the random variable or the random number generator. And the only method this has is a roll d6 method, which returns a value between um, one and six inclusive. This part of the code returns a value between zero and five. So the six being presented here is the upper bound, uh, the non-inclusive upper bound. So the highest value it could return is in five. That's why we add one so that zero to five becomes one to six. Okay. Um, okay. So now we can finally jump to the board class. Uh, the board class has seen the, the most significant changes. It's it takes care of most of our logic within the game. Uh, and the way we do the things are we, first we have some constant values. So these are to hold some of the variables in the game. So the number of columns and the number of rows and columns, it's a 10 by 10 board. So there's 100 positions. There's number of snakes, which is eight snakes and number of ladders, eight ladders. 
we have three variables to hold the board state. So this is the actual board, you know, the, holding the numbers one to 100, the positions, uh, the snakes. So the first index here specifies the starting position and the second index specifies the end position for the, for the snakes. And the same thing applies for the ladders. It's the same logic. The difference between snakes and ladders is that snakes, this, the starting position is higher and the ending position is lower while it's the reverse in ladders. So starting position is lower and the ending position is higher. We have a map here of player positions. So this is an update from last time. Last time we just had an array of integers or an array of players to hold up player positions. But now we have a bit different. Uh, we have a map which holds key value pairs where the key is the player and the value is their position. So this allows us to extract the player's position really easily. Uh, we have the constructor for our board class which is just takes in the list of players that are involved in this game. And the way we do this is we initialize the player position. So for each player, we, we set up the map um, where we put the player in as the key and the starting position is always zero. And then we create the rows by columns board. So this would be uh, the 10 by 10 board where the positions are one to 100. And then we set up the snakes and ladders. So the reason I ex uh, extracted this into a different method is because these are fairly simple uh, this is fairly simple code all it is is doing a bunch of values and you should be able to seeing on the screen right now the board that I used as an inspiration for this um, for this initialization so here we start off for the snake you know starts off at the number position 17 ends at 7 starts off at 54 ends at 34 and so on and the same thing for the ladders so the first one starts off at 4 ends at 14 second one starts off at 9 ends at 31 and so on. Once we have our board set up, um, so once we have our board set up, the method that we have that, that's of interest to us is move player, which takes the current player as an argument as well as the number the position to move. To. So this would be a value between one to six. So this is the um, how far the, the player is moving. We compute the player's position. So first we get the current position of the player and then we add whatever the value is. Uh, and then we see it has, is the new position greater than or equal to 100? So has the player reached the end value? And so if they have, then we put the new, the player's new position as 100 and then we return true because the game's done. Otherwise, the player has not ended the game so they, they haven't reached the final position. Um, what we do is we first check have they landed on a snake. So we just iterate through the list of snakes um, and then we compare is the starting position of the snake equal to the current position of the player. If it is, then we say that um, the player's new position is whatever the end value for the snake is. We update the player's position. We print out a nice message saying, that, oh, the player takes the snake from the starting position to the end position and we return false because the game is not done. We know that none of the snakes end at a, at the hundredth position, which is impossible. Um, and then if the player didn't land on a snake, we check have they landed on a ladder. Um, and we do similar logic here. We iterate to the list of uh, the ladders that we have. We check if the ladder starting position is equal to the player's current position. Um, if it is, then we update the player's new position to be the end position for the ladder. And so we update this into the player positions map. And we print out a nice message, you know, yay, the player takes the ladder from starting position to end position. We also return false because we know none of the ladders end at the value 100. We can use this to verify down here. None of these values are 100. There's no ladder starting at 100 or ending at 100. Um, so once we have this, so if neither of these is the case, meaning the player didn't land on a snake or a ladder, we know that the player just ends at a normal location. So we update the position normally and we return false because we know that the player hasn't landed on a hundred here. And one other method that we have is a two string method. This is internally used by Java to turn a human readable version of the object. So we are using this two string method to return a human readable version of the board. And this is where the interesting part came in because this has required quite a bit of tinkering 
Because if you recall Snake's Ladders, um, the first bottom row goes from left to right, then right to left, then left to right, right to left. Um, and this made things quite interesting to present because as you may have already seen from our logic here, our game always goes from left to right. But we have to print it every other row um, right to left. So we use a string builder uh, to create our string. We use a flag called odd row to keep track of which row we are presenting. Um, we have four important notes to keep in mind. So the rows will be in reverse order because if you print it normally, we'll start off from one, we'll go down to 100. But we actually want it in reverse because we want to start from 100 and then going to the very first row with the one. Okay. The even rows, which are you know from one to 10, uh, 21 to 30, all the way to 81 to 90, are printed left, left to right. While the odd rows, so 11 to 10, 31 to 40, etc., are printed right to left. So this was a talk. This is what I was talking about: how the rows are. Every other row is printed right to left. And if a player, if the current position is being occupied by a player, we want to print the player name instead of the player, instead of the position number. And when I actually run this, we'll see uh, how this plays. Uh, so we iterate through the rows. So recall that we are going from the top row to the bottom row. So that's why we start off at rows minus one. So we start off at the final row and we decrement row minus minus. Columns are normal for now. If it is an odd row, we want to be able to print it from right to left. So we first check if the player is occupying the current location. And the current location for the column is specified like this. So this is the number of columns minus one minus the current index. So this is, once again, we're counting from the end to the front. Um, if the current, if a player's position matches the current position, then we say that yes, this position is occupied and we add the player's name here. Um, and then we do this for every single player involved. If the current position is occupied by a player, by at least one player, we append, or rather we, uh, we print the uh, the player names, so whoever whoever is on these current positions. So there could be more than one player on the same location. Otherwise, so if none of the players occupy this current position, we just print the position name, the, the number that's representing the position. On the other hand, yet still very similar logic, if we are on an even row, so 86420, um, we check if, uh, again, we check if the current, if any player is occupying the current location, and once again, we iterate to the, the players. Uh, we check if the player's position is equal to the current location. So notice here, the column index here is just straightforward because we are going left to right. Um, and if this is the case, then we set the occupy flag to true again, and then we print the player's name. So we say if uh, the position was occupied, then we have player. Uh, we uh, print the player's name that are uh, on this current position. Once again, there could be more than one. Otherwise, we just print the, the position itself, so the number that's representing the position. Um, once we are done with printing a row, we switch our flag of odd row. So if it was an odd row, now we are working with an even row. And if it's an even row, we are working with an odd row. We append or print a new line character and just move on to the next row. And then at the end, we print another new line character and then we'd return the string. Now the good thing about this two string method is anytime you try to print an object, so let's say in our main class we try to print the board itself. So let's see where did that go? Uh, System.out.println uh, print the board or print board. If you were to do this without having a, a two string method, this would print some kind of memory location for the object. But since we have a two string method, uh, right here, it prints whatever this method returns. So here is the basic description of our code. Now let's see how this actually plays. So I'm going to load up the console, get rid of this previous run, and play the game. So we have our prompted messages. Um, okay, so how many players? Let's just say we want two players to play. and Something which may seem weird is that the game played by itself. But that's actually how we designed it for now. Because when a player takes turn, the human player doesn't really do anything. It's just that object rolls the dice, or that object uh, 
calls a method in the die, which calls another method in the random number generator. Um, so there's no human interaction involved. So that's why this is being played automatically. So we say that, uh, we, and we're seeing the results right here. Uh, so P0, so that's the first player, they rolled a 1, so they're put onto the first position, P0. Um, and then the second player, P1, rolled a 4, and then they take the ladder from 4 to 14, so they should have landed here, but they ended up here because of the ladder. And the game continues playing. Um, so P1 took a snake from 17 to 7, so far till the end. And there's no point going through all these things, but eventually P1 uh, ends up at the 100 position and wins. So here we have a very, very straightforward version of Snakes and Ladders. There are some things we can definitely do to improve the game. We can definitely include human interaction to make the game more interesting. We can include some kind of bonuses. So instead of just Snakes and Ladders, there's something that allows you to roll uh, two D6 instead of a single D6. Or something, um, I'm not even sure what else other kind of power-ups or negative impacts we can have. Or, you know, you roll two dice and you take the lesser value, roll with disadvantage, something like that. If you guys have any other ideas, uh, do let me know. So in the next video, we will be going over um, uh, the, um, the changes that I'm suggesting here. Or if you have any suggestions yourself, do let me know in the comments below. Um, and we'll try to improve this game. Um, so here we have our first version of Snakes and Ladders. If you guys have been enjoying these videos and have suggestions for other videos, uh, please do like and subscribe and let me know in the comments below if there are other topics that would, you would like me to cover. Thank you for watching. This has been Zan from Zan's Gaming.